like you to open to the book of Ephesians. And in verses 4, 5, and 6, Paul identifies to the to out on the mission field of Ephesus where he's now being confronted with religion as well as the Jewish faith. He's now being uh, confronted by other religions. And he identifies seven doctrines that separate the Christian church from the religions of the world. And we've been studying these seven doctrines. We're in the sixth one today. For example, in verse 4, he says, There is one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's where we are now. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So here we are. We're in the doctrine of baptism. And he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And we're in our third lesson today. We're in our third lesson on one baptism. Notice at the very top of your paper, I tell you, that we are currently studying the sixth of the seven New Covenant doctrines outlined by Paul to the Christian church that separates them from the religions of the world. We, are all, we have studied each of these, and we're down there. The reason I stop on the baptism, it was such a big deal. This, there are several of them that are big deals today. They were all big deals then. But they're kind of big. So when I find one that I think there may be confusion in the church over, I spend a little more time on that one. I, I am with this one. And we're now in the third lesson. So if you haven't been current with us on this subject matter, you need to go back and look at the Sunday lessons on one baptism. They're current, and you can pick them up and stay current with us on this subject matter. But what we're talking about in this is the baptism by Jesus of the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. He is not talking about the, the Holy Spirit baptizing. But you cannot have the Holy Spirit baptizing before you have Jesus baptizing with the Spirit. That's got to become first before the other can come. And so that's very important that you understand that. To get you a place there? Thank you. So you want to be sure you find that. You want to be sure you find that. So go back. Now, where this all starts in your Bible is in Matthew 1.11 by John the Baptist when he says, I baptize you in water, but there's one coming after me, talking about Christ, who we know is Jesus Christ, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And he's talking about the coming of Christ in two segments that we understand it. Baptism of the Holy Spirit in the first advent of Christ. Baptism of fire in the second coming. of, And he explains that in verse 12. If you have any doubt of what he's talking about, about Jesus baptizing with fire, he eliminates it. John's, John eliminates that by giving you verse 12, who explains that. And there is a theology of the new covenant called baptism of fire. And it's important that you understand that. And so we've talked about this. We're... We're now in the third of, of uh, our studies, and hopefully I'll cover, we'll complete this study today with it. On your paper, I say there's three aspects. I say there's three, there's three aspects of my lesson today. There are four. Okay, there are four. Uh, I had a speaker the second hour. I will be that speaker the second hour. And so instead of having three, I'm going to have four. Okay, that's not a problem to me. I'm just going to have four. Let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. And what it has done is taking you out of walking in the spirit and put you in walking in the flesh. 
flesh has a desire to fulfill its needs. That winds up being sin, personal sin. How do I get out of carnality back to spirituality of the indwelling Holy Spirit in my life? Confession of sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. As the work of Christ on the cross, the sin is extended, to, uh, the blood of Christ extended to sin in the personal life. When we confess it, we're forgiven and cleansed. That's essentially important. That's really important when you come to Bible study. This Bible study here, you must be under the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit who teaches and recalls. So I'm going to give you a moment of silence to bow your head, close your eyes, give you privacy from others around you. Examine personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. Make sure that confession is done. If we confess our sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And the Holy Spirit will teach you great things today prevalent to your life. Nobody walked in here without a need for God to speak to their heart today. Nobody walked into this church today without a need for God to speak to their needs in their heart. Nobody. And so if you want that done today, he will do that for you. He is a faithful God who will do that to you through the teaching. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. We pray, Father, they've come with a desire to learn in order to apply their faith to their life. We talk about the one baptism today on our third and final lesson on it, for we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk about four ideas today about my final lesson on the one baptism. It's really important. Last week I told you that there are five baptisms associated with Jesus Christ. Two of them are in our lesson. John introduced you to baptizing Jesus in water to identify him with, as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, and that he would do the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire. And so we talked about that. We talked about all five of them, but we talked about the five baptisms associated with Jesus Christ. One of those baptisms, the one baptism that's discussed here, is Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And it's really important. There's so much confusion that should not be there because people read into the Scriptures, they don't read out. You've got to learn to read the scriptures, don't read your ideas into it. Read God's ideas out of it. And so I'll show you, I'll show you some things that you miss when you don't read to hear what God is telling you. We'll, we'll discuss some of that today. One of the things that people miss about Christ and him baptizing with the Spirit, he never did it while he was on earth. Never. He did, though, his first action seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. He goes to the cross and dies. He's buried. Three days later, he's raised from the dead. He spends 40 days of post-resurrection appearances. He leaves 10 days short of Pentecost, 50 days from his resurrection. Pentecost, the word means 50 days. In that 10 days, he goes back home. And he receives the coronation of sitting on the right hand of God the Father in heaven. There's an exchange of authority. Now, I know 10 days in heaven is 10,000 years if a day is as 1,000 years, right? So the time that's important is not for Christ in heaven and what's going on, even though there is something going on. But... The 10 days for us, what are we doing while we're waiting for Pentecost? Because everybody is waiting for Pentecost. Everybody who was at the Passover is not going home until Pentecost is over. It's a four-day celebration in one. It's a, a four-event celebration in one. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. And so whoever in 30 AD, just giving you a number, in 30 AD, everybody that came to that Pentecost who came for Passover 
unleavened bread, first fruit, and stand to Pentecost, and then they're going to go home. And there are people here from at least 16 different nations by languages in Acts 2. It's, it's important that you understand the background. So one of the first actions that Jesus takes when he's, when he, after, he's, after the authority switch from God over to Christ, listen to what Ephesians, listen to what Paul writes in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, verses 22 and 23. He, God the Father, put all things in subjection that's during that ten, that 10 days while we wait on Pentecost in subjection under his feet. That's everything. How much? How many things? How many things were put in subjection during those 10, 10 days? How, how many things? How many were put? All right, circle that because you miss that. Your theology is based on that. All things are put under his authority during those 10 days. Everything that God has created is put under his authority. Under his feet means under his authority, his rulership. That's number one. Number two is the word and. And he gave him as head. That's absolute authority. Absolute authority over what? Over what? All things. Circle all. Not some things. How much? Everything's under his feet, and everything is under his head. That's submission, authority. That 10 days, God has switched that whole program over the universes. I don't know. And God spoke it all. The way we got creation, he spoke it into existence. But we're talking about all things, not some. Whatever's out there in the universe... And we know there's a lot more than we know has just now been put under his authority. Over that 10-day period, there's been a complete switch of who's in control. Now watch this. As head over all things to the church, which is his body, one body, the fullness of him who is, watch this, all in all. You know the, the dominant word in, that, in that, those verses? You know what the dominant word is? All. The dominant word is all. You always look for those. Those are markers. So here's what's happened. From first fruits, the resurrection of Christ, to Pentecost 50 days later, he spent 40 days in post-resurrection appearance preparing for Pentecost. He now goes back, and over that 10-day period, all of this authority structure is placed under him. All of that is converted over out of God and into him. And after the second coming is over, all of it's going to be switched back to the Father, if you read the end of the book. If you, if you read the end of the book. If you read to the end of the Bible, you will find that. So, this is very important you understand that because there's two parts of that. Everything is under his feet, and he is the head over everything, authority. And he mentions the church. Why is that, Why is that so big? Because the church is the key during this period the first coming of Christ, the church occupies the space of authority on earth, planet earth. While he has authority over all whatever's out there. 
What's important to his authority is what's on planet Earth. Not Mars, not Judo, not Gypsy, whatever, whatever you call them. You've missed that. There's two parts to this inauguration. There's two parts to it. One, under the faith, all, everything that God has ever spoken into existence has been transferred to his authority. That's got to be a pretty big deal. Everything created before the foundation of the earth. Now we get to the foundation of the earth. Planet earth. Now we get to it in the second part. What covers the space on the planet during the, between the first coming and the second coming is the church. It is you and I. We, we are under his headship of authority on planet earth. Planet earth made up of nations. The earth, during the time of the Messiah, first coming, our nations, therefore, go with the gospel to what? All nations, right? Of course that's right. The church is the custodian of planet earth. The church of Jesus Christ is the custodian of planet earth, not religions. The church of Jesus Christ. We are responsible for planet Earth. Which is divided up into nations. And we are to go to all the nations of the Earth. And we're to evangelize them in our generation. I mean... How are you going to do that when you won't talk to your next door neighbor about Christ? How are you going? If you won't talk to your next door neighbor or go across the street, how are you going to go across an ocean? I mean, where does your evangelism begin? It begins with you in your house, outside your house, into your community, where God sends you. He sends you as an ambassador for Christ. If you go to work, if you go to the store, wherever God sends you, wherever your feet take you, is under the headship of Jesus Christ. Planet Earth. When he says he is head over the body of Christ, and he's talking about the authority that Christ has seated at the right hand of God the Father with all authority. He talks about planet Earth because he's in Ephesus, part of planet Earth. The church has lost their way. The church I got saved in doesn't exist anymore. Evangelism of your neighborhood, evangelism of your people, sending people to the ends of the earth. I mean, we lived off of converts. I mean, something was wrong in our church if we didn't have people being saved every week. We thought we had lost our way. Somebody was being saved every week, just like in the book of Acts. You think that's a, that's a something, listen, that's the, that's the model That's the model. We have lost our way, people. We have lost our way. When I talk about going to another community to evangelize and, and be a part of, you get all upset with me. Well, then start evangelizing the community we're in. 
How about that? How about meet? How about meet me this week here? Let's go out and knock on doors and talk to people about Christ. I'm not opposed to that. Are you going to come meet me? <laughs> Roebuck, Center Point, East Lake. Stop complaining. Stop complaining. Take responsibility. That's why we're here. I don't know why you think we're here. That's why we're here. Planet Earth, out of all of the planets, planet Earth, head over the church. Planet Earth. It'd be good for us to learn about planet Earth, wouldn't it? Let me tell you a second thing. Now, he goes back, he sits at the right hand of God the Father, and the church is important, and he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit once that session's over. Point number two. The sign of languages. There's so much confusion about this. If there is one thing that should never be confused, it's tongues. The sign of languages. People talk about the sign of tongues. Glossia is a language. There's no doubt about it. It's not an unknown language either. God don't speak in an unknown language. How do I know it? Because he wrote the Bible in Hebrew and Greek. Crazy stuff. No evidence in the Bible of that. None. Just don't want to study. Don't want to study and get the truth. But here it is. In the book of Acts at Pentecost, in Acts the second chapter, you have the sign of languages referred to as tongue, glossia, in the Greek language translated into English as tongues, which was languages, well-known languages, like Spanish and French and German the dialect of the language of the day at Pentecost. And it was associated with Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. You know where tongues is first discussed as a sign of languages? Do you know where it's first discussed? It's not in the book of Acts. It's in Isaiah 28, 11. It's in Isaiah 28, 11. Acts, the second chapter, is fulfillment of Isaiah 28, 11, and Joel, the second chapter, 28 through 32. It's called the promise of the Father. And it was given to Israel, who always were looking for signs, while Gentiles were looking for wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Jews seek signs. Greeks, Gentiles, seek wisdom. you got to meet each of them on their front. Paul talks about that very thing when he's discussing the difference between tongues as a language and prophecy as a language. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians 14, 21 and 22. And he refers to Isaiah 28, 11. It's no wonder the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is confused because they don't study the Bible. They do not study the Bible. They only study it to find what they want to find, and then they read into it. They don't read out of it. Now, every time I have this great discussion, I get email. Save your email and go to my website, and after you've read everything I've told you about it, then write me. 
when you read Acts, the second chapter, and we can, not the whole chapter, but in Acts 2, when you go to Acts 2 and you're at Pentecost, which is a Jewish holiday that comes 50 days after first fruits, which is the resurrection day of Christ, you are told certain things in there. For example, we know that it was the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.1. That's the Pentecost of the time that Christ died, was buried, and raised from the dead. That's that Pentecost 50 days after his resurrection. We know several things. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to look down there. We're, I'm going to show you the 16 languages that were spoken that day. But there are some things you need to know because you don't read enough. You just don't read the Bible enough. You don't read it under the ministry of the Holy Spirit when you read and say, explain that to me. He will do that. It's a spiritual book written for spiritual people. To be a spiritual, this is a spiritual book. You got to be a spiritual person to get it. You got to study the Bible under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I don't care how many degrees you have. You don't have any in this. Well, Ron, I have my, I don't care what you have. I'm impressed by that. If you don't study the Bible and the power of the Holy Spirit, you get nothing. You cannot study it in the flesh. The natural man can't understand spiritual things. 1 Corinthians 2.14. So let's pick up a few. For example, in the second chapter of Acts, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place. Who is the they? Who is the they? Well, you'd have to look at chapter 1, wouldn't you? You can't tell me who they is unless you've read chapter 1. But this is chapter 2. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to know who the they were that were gathered in one place at Pentecost? Wouldn't it be nice to know? Don't curious minds want to know? I'm a curious mind. I want to know who these people were. I know they have to be in chapter 1. I know they have to be in chapter 1. So where, who are they? Chapter 1, verse 11 through 13. Well, they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives which is near Jerusalem on a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went into the upper room. Guess where the upper room? The upper room they rented at, Pentec at Passover. They rented this upper room at Passover. Come on, that's where Jesus did the upper room discourse of John 13 through 17. See, you've got to read more than you read. I don't know why I'm fussing. I'm not fussing at you, but I am fussing. I, I can feel myself fussing. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, and he lists the disciples. Look at all the disciples in verse 13. These all with one mind were continually to devote himself to prayer along with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now watch this, because here's the they. At that time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering about 120 persons was there. There's what you got. That's the they. You've got 120 people, followers, devoted followers of Jesus Christ, waiting for the promise of the Father. You wait. You wait. He says, you wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Acts, the first chapter. Now, where are they gathered? We know that too, don't we? They're in the upper room of a home, of a house. They're in the upper room of a house. When and where were they gathered? They were all gathered in one place the upper room of a house in verse 2. 
And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and filled the whole what? Filled the whole what? House where they were setting. Now everybody wants to make a big thing out of one thing and out of the other. Two things happened to those 120 people gathered in the upper room of a house at Pentecost in Jerusalem. Two things happened. That is called like. What could I compare what we just experienced? Well, Ron, it was like a violent rushing wind. You know what we call that in the south? A tornado. <laughs> That's what we call it in the south. And you know what people who actually are caught in one says it was like a train, a, 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 a rushing train. I got caught in one out at Ketona in a metal building. I would never been one in my life. I had only been in the south a day, uh, uh, about four or five months. I was out at Southern Natural Gas Distributing Place. And the old boy that was with me in there, there was like five of us, said, eight of us, hit that doorway and brace it. Well, I didn't know. I ran and grabbed a hold of that. And the building shook up mightily. The windows popped. The top of it went off. And boy, did I ever pray. A violent, a like, what, 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 how, Ron, what could I compare to? It's like a violent rushing wind went through the house. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? And suddenly there was from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues like fire, distracting themselves and resting on each of them. You know what they just experienced? They just experienced Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. They likened it to two things. It wasn't. A tornado didn't go through the house, and fire didn't sweep through it. But it was like it. There was this noise that just burst your eardrums. Whoa! And fire fell on people. Fire fell on them. Hundred and twenty. Hundred and twenty in a room, in an upper room of a house. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with languages as the Spirit was giving them what? What was the Holy Spirit giving them? Utterance. What in the world was the utterance? Now he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you they were languages from 16 different countries. 120 people. Galileans. Galileans, they couldn't speak their own English. They, they couldn't even speak Galilean. When a Galilean spoke, he had to listen. You don't know what they said. Now, 120 people began to speak utterance, began to be interpreters of the message. Indistinct audible utterance of a language. The reason it's called unknown because it was unknown to the person who spoke it. It wasn't unknown to the person who heard it. He heard them speak 
in their own language dialect. It was unknown to the person who spoke it. They were Galileans. They couldn't speak good Galilean. And now they're speaking perfect dialect of 16 different languages. 120 people. And it sounded like a rushing wind and fire fell. That's their observation of it. And it says, now, <laughs> I mean, you got, you got this house on fire over here. Now, now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under the heavens. And when this sound occurred in the house over there, the multitude came together. The multitude came together. The multitude came together. And were bewildered. They were bewildered. Because... They were bewildered because. Just tell them to have a seat. Well, maybe we don't. I've seen people bring people to church, but never seen them take them away. That's a, new, that's a new one for me. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because they were each one hearing them speak utterance. Remember their utterance. They hear them speaking, the utterance, speaking in their what? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In their own language. And they, the multitudes, were amazed and marveled, saying, Why are all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? And he makes a list of all the people. You can read them on your own. Look at verse 11. We hear them in our own tongues, language, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. In other words, they were preaching about Christ. They were teaching about Christ. They were teaching about Christ, whose name is Jesus, who has just died, buried, and raised from the dead, spent 40 days of post-resurrection appearances, who has gone back to the Father. Listen to me. Who saw Jesus? Listen to me now. Who saw Jesus go back to heaven? The 120. The disciples and the 120. Well, isn't that interesting? My, my, my. And they continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does all this mean? What does all this mean? And others were mocking and saying, oh, they're just, they're just drunk. They're drunk. They're full of sweet wine. They're just drunk. Those in attendance were out-of-towners who heard the noise coming from the house. They thought it was a party and people were drunk. So much, so much for, the, for, for Passover season. So much for Pentecost, a, a Jewish sacred holiday. This is what they thought by hearing all the commotion in the house and all the hoop and hollering. That's what they thought. That's what some thought. Others heard with clarity uh, their language is being, uh, the people were over there preaching out of their language. 
<laughs> it's just an amazing thing going on. And so Peter reminds them in the second chapter in verse 14 and verse 15, Peter takes a stand with the 11, raises his voice and declares to men of, men of Judea, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour, 9 a.m. in the morning. But what they are, what you are hearing and them, is them preaching Joel, the second chapter, 28 through 32. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't make it up. This is what was spoken. What are they speaking? Well, this is what's being spoken, and they're hearing it in, in these, all these different languages. They're hearing Joel. And so he tells them the story behind Joel 2, 28 through 32. Look down at the end of this second chapter of Acts. Look at the word therefore. Start with verse 33. See the word therefore? Listen, he goes through this great, this great sermon at Pentecost. Christ, Christ, Jesus is the Christ who dies on a cross, is buried, is raised from the dead, yada, yada. There's two. Watch the word therefore used in verse 33 and 36. See, we miss things like that. There are markers. These are trailer hitches. He summarizes what he said in Acts 2 and what the people have experienced. Watch this. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, one, and having received from the promise, the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, two, three, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Do you get that? No, you missed it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be confused about tongues. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, one, two, having received, from the, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth, that's his baptism of the Holy Spirit. All that session business in that 10 days, this is, what the, this is what's come out of it. Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. It was, it was, was it not David who was, it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself said, Lord, said to my Lord, set up my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. Right? Psalms 110.1. Therefore, watch this, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and God. Whoo! People are picking up stones. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? L listen to Peter's response. Repent. Change your mind about who Christ is. Change your mind about Jesus. He is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you for your children, and for all who are far off, like you and I. As many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting him, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. What a dynamic. That's Pentecost in the nutshell. Pentecost in the nutshell. <laughs> 